introduced him and I asked him if I could say anything bad about him. <laughs> and he absolutely said no way. <laughs> so everything that I tell you about him today is the absolute truth and it's good. I first met Henry in 2020. He was my intern here for 10 weeks during the summer between his junior and senior years. He was a student at Kansas State University in horticulture. And thinking back on that time, Henry, I don't know, you know, everybody's wearing a mask then. I don't know if I ever saw Henry's full face for 10 weeks, because everybody was masked up. You know, it was, that was kind of the trend at that time. But he did a wonderful job. Um, as a teacher, I've been a teacher for uh, 35 years before I came here. This one-on-one -on -one experience is one of the best experiences as a teacher I've ever had. And I, I want you to know that he was a, a fabulous student. The interaction we had was wonderful. I enjoyed it immensely. Then Henry went back to finish school. We kept in touch. And I think I mentioned to him casually, by the way, um, there's an apprenticeship available at the National Arboretum in the Bonsai Collection there. For those of you that aren't familiar with that, that is a, a collection that started with a gift from the Japanese people in 1976 celebrating our bicentennial. And Henry got to spend 11 months working on trees from guys like uh, John Naka, and I don't, did you get a chance to work on the Yamaki pine at all? I did. The Yamaki pine is another, another absolutely amazingly wonderful story. And then um, we were trying to figure out what to do in the Japanese garden because we lost our curator there and we were looking for somebody else. I said, well, you know, we ought to talk to Henry. And um, one thing led to another and he was a big hit and he got hired. And so now he is assistant curator to the Japanese garden. If you want to see some miraculous work that's been going on for about, what is it now, Henry, about a year or less? It's uh, about seven months. Seven months. That's absolutely astounding, the transformation that's been going on. He does have another three or four years of solid work every day to do. <laughs> but that's OK. Um, I don't know of anything else I could say about him that's that good, except let's please welcome Henry Basile today. Thank you very much, Larry. I do have to acknowledge that um, what he said was very biased. He did leave out the bad stuff, but um, <laughs> we will move forward. Um, so uh, as he said, I, I started off uh, working with Larry uh, in the summer of 2020 here. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how, I, how I entered the world of bonsai and how I ended up doing this experience. Uh, I'll start a little bit with an anecdote here. Um, when I arrived in Washington, D.C. Uh, to start this apprenticeship, um, one of the first things I did with curators Michael James and Andy Bell was walk the collection. And one of the things uh, that those fellas uh, had me do right off the bat was choose a tree that I found to be, um, or to have resonated with me. And of course, I'm walking into this room with trees that I've seen only in pictures uh, from artists that I've heard much about from, from Larry. And uh, the first thing I do is I go up to the first tree with a giant whirl and pick it out. So that is one of those trees, um, something that by the books might not be good. But again, there are, there are excuses or, or exceptions to the rules. So um, this was the first tree I picked uh, as one that resonated with me, and that white pine remained there for the entirety of my apprenticeship. So. So uh, Larry touched on this a little bit, but how did I end up here? Um, so I went to school at Kansas State University. I'm originally from uh, Kansas City, a suburb of Kansas City uh, called Olathe. And um, I didn't grow a plant until I was about 19. I am a part of a, a new generation of bonsai artists that probably grew trees uh, digitally before doing them uh, in, in the real life. But um, I, I uh, had one year of uh, engineering under my belt and I found it very unfulfilling. I, it wasn't for me. Uh, I spent just enough time in it to uh, 
take all of the awful math classes. And uh, that summer, I grew uh, three pepper plants in my backyard. I had a ghost pepper plant, and I grew about 10 pounds of peppers from that one ghost pepper plant. Um, it had a woody stem by the time I was done with it. And I said, you know, if I could make money off of this, I, I probably should. So I switched my major on a whim to horticulture, uh, thinking I was going to be doing production. Um, a year later, I, I arrived uh, at the, the opportunity to, to work with Larry in Denver, and uh, I remember vividly on the second day of being there, um, I had kind of uh, had the interest in bonsai because uh, as a grower, you want to be the best horticulturist you can. You want to be someone that can cultivate plants uh, that are difficult to take care of um, and keep them alive at all costs. That's all I thought I was getting myself into. Um, the second day of being uh, in the collection here, um, Larry handed me a booklet of the principles and elements of design. And I immediately looked down at it and wondered what I had got myself into. Um, but uh, it opened up an artistic side of me, and I've, I've started pursuing bonsai. Uh, obviously through this apprenticeship and uh, continuing in the Japanese garden. So uh, long, long winding road, but we all get here somehow. So um, it was a phenomenal opportunity. And uh, after that, headed out to DC. So. Move over, Mike, move back. Yeah. Um, so uh, to speak a little bit about some of my first impressions of being at the Arboretum, uh, it was a, an 18 hour drive from Kansas City <laughs> to DC, um, and uh, one of the most grueling drives, not a, not a very fun drive at all, and uh, I had a lot of time to ruminate about what smart or insightful thing I could say when I uh, appeared in the collection. Um, when I walked through the door um, and into the Chinese pavilion, which had all of, uh, all of the trees in winter storage at that time, uh, the first thing I saw in, on the ground, uh, on a cart with a flat tire, was Goshen. And uh, immediately I could tell that these fellows were very desensitized by the work that they did every day. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of very astounding trees and, and stuff that you can only hope to see or work on. Um, and at that point, um, it was a little difficult to, to come back from that. Not, not much that I said I felt like had much insight at first. But um, as with everything, you find out you're wrong. Um, so while, I'm, while I was there, um, another first impression that I had was uh, our collection here at Denver is, uh, very, is designed very specifically to emphasize this space, to emphasize um, not only the trees, but the surrounding that uh, the environment has. So a lot of these trees uh, are displayed in a way that the accent plants, um, the environment itself reflects where these trees were collected or uh, uh, continued to be worked on. Um, in this collection, uh, there are over 250 trees uh, amongst 90 species. Um, and uh, during that time, these trees of uh, very high caliber are all right next to each other. And that was something that I was not super familiar with. It, it was very overwhelming, um, but it was, uh, again, an incredible experience nonetheless. Uh, when I arrived, uh, our azalea collection was beginning to bloom. I came for a week in March over my spring break before I graduated, um, and then went uh, back in May, two days after my graduation, to work with them. Um, but uh, it was uh, uh, incredible to see a species that I had not seen in any capacity before uh, in such great health and, and developed as well as they were. Um, So I, I spoke a little bit about the curators being a, a little desensitized to the work that they were doing. Um, so uh, again, the, the observations that I had uh, were very shallow at that point. One of the first things that we did uh, was uh, we took all of our trees from winter storage uh, and we displayed them. Um, and so that task required a lot of work in the uh, d department of presentation or exhibition of these trees. And I had a little bit of experience uh, with Larry uh, in that department, but uh, taking these trees that I'd seen in photographs and immediately being quizzed after a brief hiatus from bonsai to complete school, um, I made a lot of errors on uh, as far as uh, where the front of a tree might be, <laughs> where uh, a tree might be displayed best. Um, I felt like I was kind of coming up blank. So the impression I was making on these fellows I did not feel was very strong to begin with. Um, 
But I, again, another thing that I noticed right off the bat that was uh, quite different about the collection is uh, in Colorado we deal with uh, the difficulty of growing deciduous trees and the amount of deciduous trees in the collection was astounding. Uh, as well as the, the breadth of species. We, have, we are very, very gifted to have phenomenal, phenomenal conifer species here, but the species that I was seeing in the National Collection uh, were much more uh, of the nursery stock variety of, of stuff that had been started from seed and developed and ramified to the highest level rather than collected from the wild. Um, I would say in that collection, only about 33% of the North American collection uh, was actually collected from the wild, which was very different from the, the Western Rocky Mountain style bonsai we do here. Um, again, it was certainly not the bonsai I had seen or worked with, uh, and the, the soil mix was different. Obviously, Washington, D.C. is a very, very humid place, um, and so a lot of protocols and stuff were all mixed up, and I, I kind of, in some capacity, started at, I think, I believe I can quote Larry on saying that when I was with him, I was working on level zero, and when I w was there, I began level one, so. Um, uh, I also noticed uh, the curators were, seemed very stressed out. Um, I think that was pretty evident to anyone who was viewing them, uh, but as I would go on in the job, I would realize that there was a rate that they had to, to work with, um, and to take care of a collection with only four full-time employees. Um, of 250 plus trees, plus trees in development as well, not even to count those, um, they had to work very, very quickly. So, I'll speak a little bit about our collections, uh, or the collections of the National Arboretum, just to give you, those of you who may not know, a little bit of background. As Larry said, uh, in 1976, the American Bicentennial saw the gift of 53 trees uh, to the United States. Um, and they were uh, set to be housed at the National Arboretum. Uh, very, very little history was actually given on these trees when they were given to us, so a lot of that was actually found out for ourselves. Uh, for example, the Yamaki pine, which you see uh, up near the top, uh, it's a Japanese white pine. We, we didn't know, or, or the organization didn't know for uh, at least five years that that was a tree that had survived uh, the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, and uh, as we found out more things about these trees, we could put together um, a little bit more of a, a record of, of what these trees had seen. Um, so continuing on, there were 53 trees donated, uh, 50 for each state in uh, the United States, and then three uh, specifically from the imperial family themselves. Um, one of those is uh, the Japanese red pine right here, the imperial pine, um, as well as two other um, species, a maple and a um, hemlock, Japanese hemlock. This is, uh, the Japanese collection is actually the smallest collection and has had the least additions since the start of the uh, museum, uh, but it has the <laughs> biggest uh, size difference of the trees, uh, as you can probably see our shohin trident maple up there, uh, starting about 1917 and growing over a stone. Um, and uh, the Japanese red pine started in uh, 1795 in training and about six feet tall. So there was a very large variety of species to work with as well as sizes to work with. Um, the majority of the trees in this collection, I will say, are a good two-person tree. So these are not easy trees to move through, but uh, very traditional Japanese stylings padded out. Um, as well as uh, traditional Japanese species such as the white pine, Japanese black pine, ezo spruce, Japanese maple, trident, maple, yews, and, and the like. So, um, continuing on a little bit, and uh, for this presentation, uh, at the end of each slide, if anyone has any questions, I'd, I'd love to feel free to answer. Mike. Uh, the Yamaki pine, is that from seed? Yes, it is. So it was from seed. I think it's one of the few that's uh, actually. Um, so it, it is um, from seed. I believe it was started in 1625 by the Yamaki family. Um, I do not, and I'm not entirely sure on that, believe it was a graft, but if that is one thing I need to double check on. But that, that was certainly started from seed. So. Any other questions? So to talk a little bit about uh, a collection that I did not know much about when I started. Uh, so our Chinese collection uh, kind of uh, 
to some folks who may be interested in all bonsai or American bonsai, it may seem a little out there. To me, it certainly did after seeing the, the trees in Denver. But the Chinese collection, again, it was very wild to me at first. Um, the styles were very, very radical, uh, very, very dynamic. Um, the, the pots were louder, brighter colors uh, with intricate designs on them. Um, and a lot more was uh, a lot more focus was put on the taper of the tree as well as the, the way it was trained. So 90% uh, of the trees in the Chinese collection were trained uh, ultimately only using cut and grow techniques. Um, and the curator, Michael James, who uh, has studied in China, um, is trying to restore some of these trees to their original Penjing styles as opposed to bonsai. Uh, if you're not familiar with Penjing, Penjing is um, what bonsai evolved from. It was an art form in China. There are land and rock Penjings as well, which some of our uh, similar uh, ideas of viewing stones uh, may come from. So uh, ac across this slide are, are a couple of different species. We have a, a small shoking kumquat right there with exposed roots. Um, a wind, I call it wind blown as opposed to a wind swept style because it looks like it is actively blowing in the wind as opposed to having been blown uh, in the wind uh, over time. Uh, a Chinese elm, a uh, land and uh, water, um, water jasmine, uh, Penjing right there, um, as well as part of a larger uh, rock Penjing, uh, land and stone Penjing. Uh, on the far right, we have one of Stanley Chin's uh, trident maples, which is trained over a large stone. So um, we will continue on. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. So the North American collection is the closest to what we see in the Bill Hosokawa Bonsai Pavilion here. Um, and it, even saying that, it is not very close. It's not very similar. There are a lot of species that uh, are, are solely eastern uh, side of the United States species. Um, but this breadth of species which was what uh, I believe uh, piqued my interest so much about this collection. Um, there are a lot of influential uh, bonsai artists who have donated uh, trees to this uh, collection, and as such, it is the largest collection. Um, and it is kind of this, um, so to speak, a weird dichotomy of both native species style as they are in their natural environment, but also just American artists' stylings of traditionally Japanese species. Uh, so it does become a little bit blurry there. There were Japanese black pines that were styled by American artists in the North American collection. There were Chinese elms styled by American artists in the North American collection. But I would say over half of them were species native to North America. Um, going across here, we have Von Banting's bald cypress. Uh, we have a, um, a trident maple forest that I believe is by Martin Brussels. Um, a, a pretty small chewing uh, American beach, which has been reduced to very, very small leaf size for American beach. Um, Andy Smith, uh, that is a uh, Black Hill spruce, uh, as well as um, going across the bottom of Chinese garden juniper cedar elm from Texas. Uh, that is one of John Naka's uh, grandchildren with Goshen, uh, a sweet gum, and then a bald cypress on the far right there. Um, so the, the breadth of species in this collection was incredible and we saw from these species a, a difference of background that was incredible as well. From these, this large four foot, five foot tall um, bald cypress by Guy Guidry, um, which was collected from, from that area down in, uh, I believe he's from New Orleans. Um, and uh, this one on the far left was actually a mother tree uh, for plant propagation in England before it was uh, shipped across seas to uh, Glencoe, Illinois area. So these trees have a very, very wide background of origin, uh, and it certainly is reflected in how they've developed over the years. Can you? Absolutely. Uh, the sweet gum? Yes. No. Any background on that? Is it collected or from seed? Or? I believe that was um, from seed. That is a Von Banting tree as well. So that is, uh, he, Von Banting had a few trees in the collection. He's most known for, for the bald cypress, but uh, that sweet gum is certainly one of my, my favorites in the collection. Just a very odd species and something that you don't see quite a bit in bonsai. But to speak to that a little bit, uh, you know, uh, 
a little bit of traditional bonsai styling is seen in that tree. You're seeing individual branches with pads, but you're not you're not seeing that kind of uh, natural styling. But again, there's there's so much breadth in that collection in particular that that you see you get really the best of all different varieties, which is which is very fascinating. How big is that one? That one is probably about uh, three feet tall, so uh, about a 20, 22 inch pot um, and a pretty significant size on it. The leaves turn a brilliant, like maroony purple uh, as they fall off as well. So, is it the, uh, do you know if it's the American species? Because there's a European one. Too. It is the American species of, of, of sweet leaf. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Um, as well as, uh, just to highlight a little bit, this uh, cedar elm is a species I had not seen before. The cedar elm is from Texas, and so it was very resistant to going very long periods of time without uh, watering, which was, which was very, very handy for, for what we did. So. How often would you water? So that's what I'm about to get okay. to. So, perfect. Um, so segue into that. Uh, I think it's a little bit important that we talk uh, briefly about the soil mix before we talk about what our water management strategies were there. So for our soil mix, um, it was uh, vastly different than what most practitioners out here use. Uh, it was much more organic matter heavy than what we use out here. So uh, most of our deciduous and some of our conifers all received aoki, which aoki is about 80% akadama. 18% um, pumice and 2% lava, so very, very heavy and water retaining soil. Um, and then some of our conifers, such as the Black Hills spruce and, and some of our other American conifers, were given a traditional 30 30 30 mix with Akadama, pumice, and lava rock. So uh, a lot different. Um, and what comes with these trees is as you have a tree and in training for that long, a lot of these uh, trees have very broken down soil. When you have that much organic matter in the soil, it tends to break down incredibly quickly, so it becomes a lot more important that you do very dil diligent water checks on a daily basis. Um, so uh, we did have a, a pretty large, in addition to those main three collections, we had an auxiliary collection and an azalea collection. So our auxiliary collection was things that you might, have think, you might think of as in development. Uh, a lot of trees that may have become damaged or lost a key component would, were put in the auxiliary collection for a couple of years to rejuvenate. Sometimes they were planted in the ground and still kept as part of the auxiliary collection. Um, but the development uh, was more of a redevelopment for most of these trees and very few trees in, in the museum were actually kept uh, solely for development purposes. Um, so with that heavy uh, clay soil, um, our, our, again, our, our cores were very, very dense on these trees and our water management was paramount. So uh, during the summertime, we would go out first thing in the morning, we would check water um, of all 250 trees plus about 90 trees in the grow out, um, as well as our tropicals in a conservatory. We would check all those trees for water, water as needed. Uh, this is all done by hands and by finger. Um, and uh, all of the um, trees would be rechecked again at about 1 p.m. So it was a constant thing, and if you were not quick at being able to check and thoroughly water, you did not get much else done that day. Uh, so uh, when during the periods of time where uh, they're between apprentices, it becomes a very difficult process for between a curator and assistant curator to keep all of these collections in, in good standing and good health. Um, with these clay soils, um, overwatering became an issue that I was certainly not as familiar with um, as I, you know, here uh, with uh, more porous soils, it's a lot easier to water heavily and kind of forget about it. Um, our Chinese collection had about 25 to 30 Chinese elms alone, um, as well as uh, a lot of other deciduous trees, which show very, very quick uh, stress after being watered heavily for several days. So um, our curators, uh, an idea that I was kind of uh, taught in horticulture school um, was the fact that you are either a wet grower or a dry grower. Again, that's kind of a definitive, you know, that's an absolute, and you never speak in absolutes, but to some degree, uh, folks either keep their soil a little bit more wet or they keep them in incredibly dry. Uh, in this environment, it was a much drier environment, so these are, or excuse me, they kept it much drier than we certainly do here. Um, so uh, the environment that they kept these trees in was uh, for hornbeams, Chinese elms, trident maples, 
and other deciduous species, they would let uh, new twigging uh, as well as leaves actually begin to wilt before they would water them. There were crab apples that I uh, would have panic watered when I was alone, uh, that my curator would come back in the next day and say, hey, we were waiting on that, we didn't want to water that today, um, that I was just astounded that they could make it another day when the soil was completely tan, you know, completely dried out from the, from the top. Um, and part of that was in fact to uh, uh, the fact that uh, many of these cores had not been repotted, had not been touched during repotting, so the cores were much more dense than the exterior uh, soil. So uh, water would run through the exterior soil significantly quicker than it would through these cores. So if not watered appropriately, they would dry out. Could you define what you mean by cores? Yeah, so uh, to speak, of, I guess, a little bit more about a soil core, uh, we refer to the soil cores as just the soil that is directly beneath the nabari of the tree. So in that spot, it's a very difficult spot to get that completely, uh, especially on a tree with big nabari, to get it completely saturated. Um, and so in a lot of these cases with trees that uh, have cores that may not have been touched for decades, um, sometimes the water would run through the bottom of the pot, but it was just going through the looser, less broken down soil on the exterior of the pot without actually uh, uh, penetrating the interior of that core. So that was something that uh, I'll talk a little bit more about when we get to some of the challenges that we faced, but um, it, it definitely makes for a much more volatile tree, um, but it can be an effective method for reducing leaves or keeping twigging very small. Um, Henry? Yes, sir? The far right image, what are we looking at? Right there, so uh, that soil is Kanuma right there, but that is uh, one of our azaleas. Um, and that was an azalea with 25 to 30 azaleas. Uh, that was one of them that bit the dust. So you can see um, part of the, uh, the, the root hairs are no longer that nice white color, they're, they're dark brown color. Uh, and that is what we were seeing um, after uh, that tree had, had, had died, so. Henry, I want to go back to Mike's question. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you do to get moisture into that cord? So a lot of it, um, for trees that were particularly difficult, a lot of our shoki were particularly difficult, believe it or not, um, we would submerge the trees um, and let them completely stop bubbling before we would put them back out on display. Uh, in other cases, when I would go and do water duty in the mornings, uh, we were expected to water trees uh, a minimum of about three to four times every time we were going through. We would leave about five minutes in between each time, so it was really this circuitous, you know, you, you go through um, each pavilion once, twice, three times to water the trees that you know need to be watered to make sure that they penetrate into the core. So, lengthy process, absolutely, but um, uh, in the long run, we had success with it. So, so talking about how difficult it was to water out there, uh, one of the past uh, apprentices had, had made this entire list uh, for how to water a bonsai. I don't think it necessarily captures, I, I think it does capture everything that needs to be captured, uh, but this is kind of what was going through the minds of our curators to some degree. Um, everything from what is the horticultural health of the tree to do you have the luxury of checking the tree later in the day? Um, what season is it? Uh, anything here um, certainly has an effect on the overall watering of the tree and whether it's overwatered or underwatered. Um, and a lot of it had uh, ultimately came down to the different watering styles of the curation staff. Um, our uh, main water, Andy Bello, who is the assistant curator out there, uh, is a very, very heavy-handed water, but he lets things dry out entirely to a point that I am not comfortable with in any capacity before he would water them. Um, whereas uh, Michael James, our main curator, uh, will try to push things as far as he can, um, but would ultimately give things spritzes in the afternoon to hold them over until the next day. Um, all those little variations, right, you might see that spritz, that soil, that topsoil might be wet, but that core might be bone dry. So knowing who watered last is, is, is actually very important uh, when it comes to maintaining a collection of this size. So moving on to development. Um, development was not, yes sir? Uh, back to your 20 criteria. Yes, how, how absolutely. You, 
how do you journal or keep track of all the trees and what you observe when? I mean, do you have extensive journaling? Or? Well, so there is a degree of record keeping that we keep, uh, and it is something I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but as far as watering goes, it was all up here, and that was uh, one of the, the most difficult things to learn at first. It took a lot of very slow six-hour watering sessions that basically resulted in me getting nothing else done during the day. Um, but by the time I, I had left there, um, I had become familiar with the trees and, and the artists of the trees, and so I'd be able to say, oh, I need to water um, this black pine by this XYZ artist, by Toro Ito, or something like that. Um, and uh, the curator would know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I would know exactly what I'm talking about. So when I when I first started, my my technique was I always keep like a little tiny pocket handbook in my back pocket, and I would just write down the number because each tree has a number in the collection, and I would write that number of that tree to either come back to check it in the afternoon or to uh, remember that this tree hasn't been watered and will need to be watered the next day. So a lot of mental math going on up there, but uh, despite it. Uh, didn't kill any trees, so that's good. Um, <laughs> but moving on, yeah, it's, it, it is a difficult process and something, especially as you're an apprentice, uh, you have to find your own way to kind of understand the breadth and, and which ones you did. You have to find your own way of remembering, is, is I, I suppose what I'm saying. So. And were you using DC tap water? <laughs> we were not, so the, the National Arboretum was on, uh, has its own source of water, but not the DC tap. <laughs> Though I don't know what that would do, but. Uh, continuing, so development. Development was something, uh, I spoke a little bit about the auxiliary collections, as well as our azalea collections. Those were the two collections that received the most by the books development of any trees. Uh, in the museum. So most of the trees that we uh, received as donations uh, were already in a stage of development that was so highly developed, at least secondary or tertiary branching was already on these trees. Um, so development was really used more as a tool uh, to keep taper okay, to refine certain things, and to also um, repair trees that may be in bad standing. Um, so, uh, while I was there, I heard a, many uh, nightmare stories about what has happened to, to trees in the past. Uh, everything from when taking down certain roofing panels, uh, a roofing panel blow, blows off and knocks the apex off of a treasured Chinese elm. Um, luckily, they have insurance to do that. I don't know how insurance works for trees, um, but to some degree, our development was a response to it. So, a lot of trees, um, especially with cores of that age, would just um, an individual branch or a tree in a forest uh, might die off and an entire restyling is needed because of that, especially in the case of forests and cycades. Um, cycades being um, more of a landscape planting with uh, small uh, plants incorporated into it. Um, so uh, a lot of this uh, we can kind of see here. Uh, I put this picture of the trident maple, the Stanley Chin, that is uh, called uh, the dragon. That's a very Penjing style tree, but uh, the, the taper is uh, the highest uh, focus for those styles of trees. Uh, the taper is the one thing that I was hammered in time and time again. If the taper is bad on a Penjing style tree, um, it is ultimately um, not going to be very successful. Um, we would let certain situations, this is a, one of John Naka's trees right here in the middle. This is a pomegranate. Um, and because of the way pomegranates flower and we really wanted to get a fruit on a pomegranate, we would let individual strong juvenile shoots extend uh, so that their flower buds wouldn't be aborted when pruning. Um, that's why it looks a little bit scraggly like that, but uh, ultimately if we had cut all of those off, we would have had no chance of, of flowering or fruiting, which we did uh, have that year. Um, this, this, uh, this forest planting right here um, is one to, to kind of showcase the fact that a lot of these forests may have one tree uh, just suddenly die within it, and that requires the care of a curator to go back in and try to assess how do I reconcile this now defunct planting with the original goal of the artist. Um, and so that is something that we saw a few times uh, while I was there, and uh, that is certainly one of our more uh, focused on development uh, parts of the job. 
Um, this is a planting by Chase Rosade right here. This was one that uh, had continued to, to lose individual trees um, and was actually put in the ground to try to regain some vigor. Uh, that's why you're seeing it kind of all blown out near the top. Um, it was repotted and then um, a, a heavy pruning was done, but this was prior to, to the winter pruning that it received. Um, and again, our azalea collection, we had very, very nice azaleas, and we had pretty okay azaleas compared to, again, within the frame of everything else in the collection. Um, so a lot of these uh, azaleas are very basally oriented plants, and so uh, we oftentimes saw the apexes of these trees failing or branches near the top failing, and would, it would require a large uh, restyling of the trees. So. Um, another thing that they had the apprentices do at some point uh, was um, they, the National Arboretum is a, a germplasm repository, which means that it introduces a lot of new species and cultivars of trees, uh, in particular um, crepe myrtle, lilacs, uh, a lot of a very vast variety of different trees, and something that uh, kind of a tradition that had been carried on was. Uh, that the uh, apprentice would style a few of these trees, these uh, introduced species, uh, to kind of uh, honor the, the arboretum as a whole. Talking a little bit about refinement and ramification. Um, so this is the majority of the work that I did in the collection. Um, I would say about 80 to 90 percent of the trees were at the level of at least third uh, tertiary branches, uh, tertiary branching, so very, very fine twigging on our deciduous, um, and a lot of work as far as it goes um, for uh, our ramification and our refinement. Um, so continuing on with this a little bit, um, all pruning of these bonsai, especially at the beginning of the spring, uh, so you see the, the traditional refinement and ramification where twigs are cut back to uh, their first buds on a twig. Um, these were had to be thinned in a way that maintained the overall look of the tree, and some styles, particularly our penjing, had to maintain the or original form of that style in the case of the windblown. Uh, Chinese elm here. Uh, any twigs that were growing on the other uh, side of the tree or in the opposite direction had to be completely removed. Um, this Montezuma cypress here uh, is another one of John Nanka's trees. Um, this was one that was a little bit more difficult to get to a certain level of refinement because uh, the twigging uh, had a, a tendency to grow very, very long internodes. Uh, so uh, between bifurcations, it was very difficult to reduce down. Um, and ultimately, that tree had been left unrepotted for about four or five years to achieve a, a smaller level of ram ramification. Um, again, our punica up there, which is our pomegranate, um, ramified to a very high level, as well as one of our Japanese black pines. Um, as with uh, Japanese black pines, uh, very, very uh, familiar with needling and, and candling and bud pinching, that was done. Um, first thing, it, it, as soon as uh, it was an option for us, um, and those were taken to a significant level as well. Are there any questions about uh, refinement or ramification? Sir? So it, it sounds like the goal is always with all the trees to keep them in the state that they were intended by the artist. Absolutely. It seems really hard. It's, it is very hard. <laughs> and so one of the uh, challenges that we faced uh, in the national collection uh, was the fact that artists, families of artists, uh, friends of artists show up unannounced out of nowhere. They want to see that one tree. We came from Texas to come see this one tree. Um, so the majority of the trees, about 80% of the trees were on display at all times. We probably had about 175 to 200 trees on display at all times of the 250. Uh, maintaining the health becomes very difficult. And because of that, COVID is kind of a respite for the, <laughs> for the museum. Uh, while the doors were closed, some things were put in the ground, things, some things were put in bigger boxes and allowed to regain health. Uh, but something that uh, the curators expressed to me many times and that I expressed many times is the fact that many of these trees that are in bad health need to simply be put into development pots. They need to be put into boxes with perlite around them or a more porous soil to regain that vigor before they can be ramified or refined to that level again. Um, 
this was not an option for many of the trees. Uh, if someone comes from uh, India to view Goshen and Goshen is off display, um, it becomes a very difficult thing to explain to a patron who's traveled very, very far. Um, so again, in, in the curatorial space, it becomes difficult when you're uh, kind of expected uh, in the way that it is a museum rather than a collection. It's, it's interesting because it is a documentation of all these trees from important artists, um, which uh, I think any collection is. But at this museum in particular, there is this expectation of these will all be on display and will remain on display. Um, and so keeping them in that health is certainly something that they tried their best at, and I tried my best at when I was there. But um, our grow out does contain a lot of trees that have a branch or two that are not looking too good. Um, but um, we tried our best to, to develop those to that level. So continuing on a little bit with refinement, our azaleas were kind of interesting to treat with refinement as you could shear off most of the foliage um, or shear off most of the uh, spent flowers immediately after flowering and because of their back budding capability they could completely flush that out the next year. Um, that was something that I found to be completely astonishing. It was almost like hedge burning, um, which uh, I know is a dirty word, but to some degree is something that was effective for us when we had 30, 35 plus azaleas. Um, but yes, uh, that structure and intent was kind of our main thing, uh, making sure that uh, removing those far extended br extending branches and pulling down uh, other branches that may be higher in the canopy to fill those spaces to try to keep a tree looking uh, at the same level of refinement as long as we can uh, was, was the goal. Uh, finding those replacements and moving individual branches and twigging into that space was a, a large part of that. Did you have a photographic archive you could reference to see? We what did, you absolutely. So, um, there we go. <laughs> to speak a little bit about record keeping. Um, so, uh, the collection, again, uh, Daryl, you spoke a little bit about this. It is an abundant. Uh, source of uh, library resources, of images of the trees. We have Polaroids dating all the way back to, um, you know, 90s and 80s on some trees, and then the original images, the original film images of a lot of the trees as well. Um, so for a lot of these, we could see what the artist was thinking at that time. Uh, a lot of the Japanese uh, trees that arrived when they arrived had very intense ramification, but not very thick uh, bases, trunks, or primary branches. So a lot of those were actually refined, or uh, not refined, but um, developed a little bit as the refinement was, was kept up. Um, as far as our record keeping went, every single time we fertilized, every single time we pruned, every single time we needled, it, even as far as lime sulfuring, every single thing that we did was written in a uh, written binder as well as digitally uh, upkept. So um, it, it was a very helpful tool to be able to see. Um, I think we lost three trees when I was there. Um, and uh, one of them, uh, we, we sent a soil test in, we sent everything in. It was a crab apple. We weren't entirely sure if it was fire blight or what it was. Um, but by being able to go through your records and see what treatment was used on this tree last year, what soil mix was used last year, um, or any major branches removed, uh, you're able to keep up with what you did wrong. And uh, killing trees is a normal part of bonsai, but um, learning from it is, is the only way you're going to progress. So uh, especially in a curatorial space where you don't want to kill any trees, it's very important that you know why something uh, may have failed and are able to explain it, especially to an angry artist. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I was going to ask if uh, a tree died, did you tell the artist, or...? <laughs> so I was apprentice. That was out of my pay grade. I was very fortunate that I didn't have to tell XYZ why their tree died, or that their tree died. Um, but yes, yeah, so I would say one of the reasons that the, uh, the main curator gets paid the big bucks is because he's the one who has to call Dan Robinson or XYZ to tell him that, you know, their tree may have died. And that's not a very savory job for anyone. Um, but at the same time, um, most people who pra are practitioners or have done uh, bonsai for a long time understand that that happens. Uh, 
it's more difficult to describe it to the families who, uh, you know, the artists may have passed. Um, they're coming to view it and it's not in good shape. Why is it not in good shape? We donated it, X, Y, Z. It becomes a very difficult part and definitely one of the biggest challenges of, of being a curator in these spaces or, or doing curatorial work in these spaces. Would, uh, would you do the same if, uh, like, you had to restyle it? Like, oh, hey, we have to add a new tree. Signif a significant restyling. Um, if it was someone who was going to be savvy that it had been significantly restyled, I think in the case of artists, certainly. Uh, in the case of families, um, we keep them updated, but it might not be as blatantly <laughs> or explicitly stated. Um, but to some degree, they just want to know that the tree is doing well and looks, and looks good. For these uh, like older, obviously older trees, was there any particular ailment that you saw that would take them out, or was it a very so? To my knowledge, a lot of it had to do, so our biggest problems that we saw were fungal on our deciduous. Very big problems with fungal on deciduous. Our Chinese elms dealt with that quite a bit, as well as our Japanese maples. That's why they tell you don't miss your Japanese maples, right? Because they'll get fungus on them. So uh, we did see that. Um, and uh, as with all plants, as a plant uh, becomes, um, uh, is uh, ailed by a disease or a, a plant disease or, or sickness, it does not go away within that plant's lifetime. Um, they can be purely cosmetic or they can be uh, significantly damaging. In the case of certain species like pyracantha, crab apple, anything in the rose family, we had to be incredibly diligent that if there were any signs of fi fire blight within a, like a, basically a half mile radius on the arboretum, we had to make sure that those were kept within a cold frame, kept within uh, a, a closed space because uh, some of those fungal diseases can be incredibly detrimental uh, to these trees. Um, on some of our older trees, uh, it became more of an issue of, uh, so soil was a big thing. Uh, as heavy and, and um, dense as that clay soil was, some of these trees haven't been repotted you know, the, since 2011, these trees were not repotted for a very long time. As that core gets older, and as that core is not um, rejuvenated by actually fishing out all that really old comp or uh, condensed or compacted soil, um, those roots just get finer and finer and finer. Uh, eventually to your point where you either don't know if it's dry on the inside or wet on the inside, or a branch just randomly aborts. That's usually the sign that something's wrong and it's time to uh, repot that tree. Um, and so several trees, uh, for example, there's a very large, about four foot uh, Japanese alcova that is uh, kind of in a traditional broom style. Um, and large branches on that were lost pre-COVID, but because of COVID, we, they were able to put it back in the ground and, and grow some of those branches back to a nice taper. Um, so as the tree gets older, the more curious and unexpected the, <laughs> the ailments become, um, but ultimately fungal was, was one of our biggest issues that we dealt with. Um, are you, you going to talk about the repotting? Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no worries, I got good pictures for you folks on that one. Um, so uh, moving on to our repotting, so here are a couple of our trees. <laughs> um, so these are uh, some of our penjing style trees. Uh, you can kind of see um, <laughs> me and Andy working on this tree together. I got the very honorable role of tree holder for a lot of these <laughs> repotting. Um, but uh, again, uh, this uh, proved a lot more difficult than uh, a lot of, of normal uh, repottings with, with, with trees. Uh, go. Um, so some of these species, we would go to repot the tree, the entire core would be gone. It would be <laughs> at a point of uh, almost complete uh, absence of the core in the middle. It had broken down so much. Um, some of our uh, large slab plantings had incredibly dense cores, so much so that when we arrived to repotting season uh, at that time uh, in winter, uh, some of our repottings uh, involved us as you can see kind of on these wooden blocks, mounting the tree up uh, and then actually uh, using chopsticks or dowels to remove the soil from the center of the core, packing it up with sphagnum moss and regular soil and then reinserting it into the pot. Basically creating a donut of roots uh, and then reincorporating the soil into these cores. And uh, a lot of trees have 
responded very well. Um, I've kept in touch and I was like curious about if that would actually have a, a, the effect that we wanted it to have. Um, it has in, in most cases. So, um, so yes, reprotting was a big uh, portion of this process. I had uh, another uh, fantastic role of going through and uh, making a, a compilation or a list of the last time that every single tree in the collection was repotted. Um, going back to some trees not having been repotted since 2008 or 2011, forest plantings that may have been in good health, so they just kept putting it off a year, kept putting it off a year. Um, whereas our, our two-heen, our 18 to 24 inch trees might get a repotting every year two to three years. Um, some of our big trees like the Yamaki pine, which is about four foot, in di uh, four foot diameter canopy, um, as well as our Japanese red pine that was uh, six feet tall, those trees uh, might not be repotted uh, until every six to 10 years. So um, I missed the repotting of the red pine uh, by a month, which I was very upset by, but that tree weighs uh, approximately 400 pounds, so it would, it would be like a, an actual using a hydraulic lift to, to repot some of these trees. Uh, the Yamaki pine was repotted in the same method uh, during um, COVID, um, and it required three folks and, and a hydraulic lift. So some of these trees are big, <laughs> but um, I was, they were like, all right, you're the apprentice, you're gonna sift all the soil and, and repot a lot of our, our shoheen. So <laughs> I got that glorious job. But um, learned a lot through the process. They used a lot of uh, basket uh, tie downs on uh, all of our uh, repottings, uh, as well as uh, they used a long grade sphagnum that had been shredded up uh, as a top dressing, and uh, a kato, I believe is it, it's called, uh, as a muck uh, to. Uh, Kind of solidify the uh, outside of um, our slab plantings, primarily our forest and slab plantings. So, repotting was basically two straight months for me, um, and before that was lime sulfuring. So, not a very fun couple of months. Um, <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about you were saying the core absolutely decomposed? You put sphagnum in there. Can you talk about when you would do that and how much sphagnum? Absolutely. So not very much sphagnum was used. It was just used more as a method to retain some of the soil or to fill up pockets that we use to insert soil, maybe from the top. So a lot of these times we would actually bore out a hole uh, right next to the nabari of these trees um, and, and begin to pack it. Um, the difficulty with that is when you're packing a tree from the top when it's already sitting in a pot, that top part that of that cavity uh, is not getting filled up with that soil. So that sphagnum was used to insert and fill that space uh, without leaving a huge air bubble above, you know, in, in, uh, in the core uh, right, be right beneath that tree. So kind of used as a filler in some situations. Um, but we found everything uh, during repots. We found old ceramic pieces in some of the cores that had come over from Japan. We found oyster shells that were used to um, originally start some of the seedlings uh, as a uh, method to kind of disperse the roots or, or create an abari. We found a lot of weird trinkets uh, during our repottings, but it was, it was always interesting. So. Um, So um, I did want to share this with you. This was uh, another thing that had been created by one of the past apprentices. Uh, I believe this was created by Aaron Hughes, who is out at Huntington Gardens now. Um, but this is the stored energy and temperate trees over month of year. So a lot, a lot of things went into when we were choosing to do a lot of repunnings on these trees. Um, and everything had a rationale. Everything had intent behind it. There was a reasoning. Um, for nearly, nearly everything we did, because if we said that we did something without a reason and it didn't work, who would you have to explain yourself to? So um, I just thought this was an interesting infographic. This is, again, for Washington, D.C., so beginning fertilizing in March is crazy here, but um, in D.C. It's, ca it's something you're capable of doing, but um, using uh, the idea of, um, Mike, so Michael James, the main curator, uh, one of the first things that uh, I spoke about with him um, was uh, the fact that uh, bonsai is, is a large game of energy balance. 
uh, making sure our shoots and our roots are balanced at all times is really uh, the name of the game, as well as balancing um, the energy going to certain branches. When certain branches are removed, energy is then sent through the vascular system to these other branches to thicken, develop, ramify, X, Y, Z. Um, this was a huge tool and kind of a, a really, really nice way for me to rationalize the decisions I was making, um, as well as the idea of taper. Taper was really emphasized. Um, decisions on taper uh, or uh, the um, being able to balance uh, the uh, understanding of, of that um, was, was really beneficial in, in the long term. So, Henry, I have a question. Right? Yes, absolutely. Um, do you know of any like horticultural rationale for uh, not fertilizing? You know, basically in summer. Oh, not fertilizing in summer. Well, that's the chart said. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, as our trees are coming out of dormancy in the springtime, uh, we have all the carbohydrates stored up from that dormancy and it becomes this fleshy new growth. Um, at that time, as it is expending that energy to push out that new growth, there is still a certain degree of energy kind of along that line as it decreases. So we can prune right after that some of that new growth has come out. That's why some folks get away with partial defoliation, full defoliation to reduce size of certain leaves. Um, but once we get to the middle of the summer, when it, we're, reading, we're, we're getting to our heat stress, so anytime a plant is above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, the proteins stop working at their full efficiency and we get what's called heat shock and uh, transpiration is not as good, it needs more water and the nutrients aren't going through the plant uh, as well. Uh, so when we reach about June in the summer, probably July for us, um, we get to a point where our leaves, all that stored up energy from that dormant winter time has been expended and is all sitting in those leaves right now. If you were to defoliate that tree at that time, it would have a very bad time. Um, so it is dependent on those cooler temperatures come August, September to absorb that energy to send those carbohydrates into both the root system, the branches, uh, and the xylem tissue within the tree uh, to kind of store that going into uh, our um, fall time. Uh, so the reason they say don't prune like early fall is because it's going to push some of that energy that has just been sent in to, to keep it alive through the winter. It's sending that right back out and then it's just gonna crunch up, fall off. Mm -hmm. Your tree's gonna be very sad uh, next springtime. So. But what about the fertilizer in June? So the reason that we uh, stop fertilizing in June, is that what you're... Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So uh, fertilizer is used um, uh, as a method to push um, leaf growth. So when you're fertilizing a plant, very, very little of that energy is going into the root system. It is actually going into producing the photosynthate producing leaves and stuff like that. It kind of emphasizes that. Um, rather than the root system. So when you put all that fertilizer in the plant, all those nutrients are immediately going and being pushed into new leaves, which then fail to harden off by the time fall comes around, so they're lost ultimately um, if you fertilize too late in the season. So. Well, what are your units of energy stored? You know, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question for Aaron Hughes. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I had an answer for that, but uh, very, very official, <laughs> very official graph, but um, to some degree, this is as just a learning tool. So. No, it makes sense. I just. I would, yeah, I don't know why there's numbers in there if it's just. <laughs> but. So, one of the things that I think uh, has carried on with me. Uh, the most into uh, working in the Japanese garden space, working in Shofu and here, is the idea of presentation and exhibitions. Um, what I learned very quickly is there's a lot of interplay between all forms of Japanese aesthetics. So Japanese aesthetics are used in Ikebana over there. They didn't like my uh, dead Ikebana, that's what they called it, because some of the plants are dead. Ik means living, so it's just it's not living. Um, but uh, we had a, a collection of uh, viewing stones as well, uh, as well as different exhibitions, everything from E.K. Bana to um, our uh, Lunar New Year exhibition for our Penjing. Uh, so you see a lot more whimsical stuff during our ex exhibitions. You can see this pyracantha, uh, which is what this is, these little wicker baskets full of fruit. Um, so especially within our Penjing displays, we were, we were able to have a little bit more leeway or whimsy. Um, and uh, 
as some folks think with, with Japanese culture, not everything is serious all the time. Uh, there is some degree of, of, of joking uh, or, or whimsy within it. Um, but the biggest thing I learned about presentation when I was at the museum uh, was that while other folks may not see your intention, they may not see your rationale for why you have done something, it is still important to have one. Um, this is an exercise I did with Michael James, a curator, uh, several times where uh, he would, uh, we had a storage room of stones, our, uh, our stands, our scrolls, um, and then obviously we had our trees available to us. Um, a lot of these uh, mornings that I would have one-on-one -on -one with Michael on a Saturday when the assistant curator was there, my assignment would be make a rationale for why you're making this token open display. Um, what scroll did you pick? Why did you pick it? What uh, stone did you pick? Why did you pick it? As well as what stand, uh, bonsai, whatever it is, um, there, there had to be a rationale for it. And uh, everything from uh, as ridiculous as it sounds having uh, during our new Lunar New Year exhibit, we had a, a beautiful scroll of a full moon. Um, as well as some falling uh, momiji or the maple leaves, um, and uh, because it was year of the rabbit, a rabbit placed on a pedestal near the base of the tokonoma looking up at the full moon. Um, every single step of that was thought through, and there was a stone as well. The stone uh, was a nice uh, green color, um, and Michael, knowing much more about China than I do, knew exactly which area of China it was from, um, and knew that it would be um, good to incorporate into uh, the display. So um, trying to carry that forward into uh, the, the bonsai work you do, the displays that you create, is something that um, as long as you have a rationale or a reasoning for why you did it, it may not be uh, something that others see, but it is, is reflected in your work. So, uh, and is yes. that space in the middle there, is that open to the public? This space right in the middle? Yeah. So this is an example of our, so this is our Chinese pavilion or the Chinese pavilion at the museum. Um, so this is what it would look like during winter storage. Um, our winter storage accommodations were, uh, they put big glass roof panels on it and they kept it right at 30 degrees. It would never go, or when it would go be, uh, below 30 degrees, a heater would come on. Um, so that space was used uh, ultimately as a cold, a large cold frame uh, for winter storage of things that could, that could withstand that space. That would be on display all Okay, and so if that is public? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, are most of the trees displayed with scrolls or without? So within the actual um, pavilions, they're not displayed with scrolls. Uh, what we had are individual seasonal exhibits and an exhibits gallery. So during that time, uh, we had our tokenoma in that space, we had the Chinese Scholar Studio, which see right there in that space as well. Um, so a lot of that was uh, where we would view our suiseki, our gongshi, a lot of our, our stone and, and uh, related um, materials, as well as exhibits such as uh, we had a, a Japanese craftsman come and stake up a, one of the cherry trees, on the, or the, the flowering cherry trees, the sakura, uh, on the grounds. Um, and there was a whole exhibit for that. Uh, but for things such as our, our Lunar New Year exhibit or other exhibits, our Azalea exhibit, the trees were brought into that space, um, mossed heavily over the soil so that they were presentable. And then uh, during, uh, <laughs> we would go in and check in the morning. So that was one of the first uh, jobs I was, I was given as I, as I uh, got there was uh, working with the Azalea collection and the Azalea exhibit. Um, and so, uh, those trees were brought into that space, taken out, watered, let to sit, and then put back in there before opening. And uh, I picked up a lot of uh, spent leaves and spent uh, <laughs> azalea blossoms, but uh, ultimately we tried to keep that, that exhibit space as pristine as we could, whereas our collections or uh, pavilions where just trees are exhibited might not be 100% tidy all the time. Um, again, uh, I, I got uh, an opportunity. So one thing I will say about the National Arboretum, phenomenal Kusumono collection, but a lot of the Kusumono were made on the spots for, the, for exhibitions. So small stuff such as this with our kumquat there um, uh, were just put together on the fly by the staff. Um, whereas some of the larger, uh, more established Kusumono that had been designed in previous years by Young Choi uh, were left there um, and uh, kept in a temperate greenhouse for 
So speaking a little bit about challenges, we've, we've already touched a little bit on the fact that dealing with the artists uh, or the families of artists when uh, a tree passes on is a very, very difficult thing to do, especially as a curator or in, on cura curator curatorial staff, um, but also dealing with yourself when these trees die. Um, it is, no matter what, always someone's fault, unfortunately. Um, and I saw, uh, not so much in myself, but uh, certainly in the curators, a lot of personal responsibility and uh, reflected in their mood. Bad days were had when a tree was not doing well. Um, so again, this was a, this was a job that was, was very difficult for them in that way. Um, and it was certainly a challenge of the job. Um, we spoke a little bit about the ancient cores of some of these trees being a lot more volatile trees that have these old cores that may not have been repotted or touched for decades, just aborting a branch at random. Um, that was something that we dealt with, especially with trees um, that, uh, especially the Japanese collection, I should say. The Japanese collection has a lot of cores that were just untouched um, and have very traditional, uh, in some of them, solely Akadama and even some field soil. So uh, something that I struggled with, and you can kind of see here in the middle picture, is remaining as diligent with the trees in development as you are with the trees that are fully refined. When you have John Naka's Goshen right at the beginning of the North American Pavilion, that's one that you check every day, you make sure if that tree so much as loses a branch, you're packing up your bags, you're moving away. Um, but uh, trees like this are, you know, part of our azalea collection are trees that uh, may have lost certain branches or are not looking their best or a good 10 years out from being displayable again. Sometimes it's difficult to remember those trees with the same level of attentiveness that you may remember Goshen or any of the trees that are on display. Uh, so that was something that I, I certainly struggled with. Right here, I sent a very panicked text to the assistant curator and I went, I think it a branch on this azalea is dying. And then he just texted back very curt. Um, that one was already on its way out. I was like, oh, okay, this was not my fault. But um, the grow out was particularly a difficult space. And uh, the reason that I think a lot of the Kusumono were made on the fly is because when you're watering 250, 300 trees, Kusumono kind of take a back seat and uh, sometimes things are just forgotten. So um, I wrote on challenges, there's just a note that just says lime sulfur. Um, it smells really bad. We had to do that for like a month straight, and I got a lot of clothes stained, so I guess that counts as a challenge. Um, volunteer management, I think with anything. Um, we had a, a little bit different uh, levels of volunteers, everything from, from beginner level to a very uh, high uh, experience level of volunteers. But uh, to some degree, uh, Michael, Michael James, uh, the curator, bit more soft-spoken of a man than, <laughs> than, uh, so, than myself or, or than the assistant curator. So that volunteer management I did see uh, in some cases, just miscommunication can, can result in a tree uh, being pruned the wrong way or uh, a certain branch that may not have needed to be removed being removed. Um, so as with anything, miscommunication, even just between the two curators, the assistant curator and the main curator, uh, may result in a, an unfavorable decision. Or maybe someone thought something was watered and it was not. Um, things like that, we try to keep at a minimum, but occasionally they would happen. Um, what being demonstrated in that rightmost photo? So, uh, to speak a little bit about the fact that some of the cores um, <coughs> were so untouched, this was a tree in the Japanese collection, actually. Um, and this was a trident maple. Um, this was the one that I believe, I wish I could have taken a picture of it, but this was the one that we found original field soil in as well as oyster shells um, in the soil of this plant. It had been one that hadn't been repotted since 2016 when it was 2022. Um, so we just saw very, very, very uh, root pound root systems on a lot of these trees and being able to, especially on a tree with a large stone uh, right above the nabari or incorporated into the nabari, uh, working into that core became very, very difficult. So um, flat, getting anything to flower was very difficult as, I, as I'm sure many of you can relate to. Um, and uh, differing, anything from differing styles and differing opinions. So um, uh, our main curator, Michael James, was a very, very talented penjing artist. Um, and uh, differences just between the curator before him and the curator now uh, have resulted in some of those penjing uh, kind of returning to a bonsai style and, and, and coming back. So there's always these uh, 
you can see the distinct marks and the distinct uh, style of some of the curators, just like you can see it with any bonsai artist. Um, so trying to remain as uh, unbiased or as true to that form and the style uh, is a big deal. It, for the collection, um, is there any oversight from the Arboretum in terms of artistic or size of the collection or goals and objectives, or is it straight from the main curator down? So the curator has a big say in everything as far as art, the artistry goes. So uh, how they're styled, none of that comes from the big boss. The big boss, um, the main thing uh, that he had responsibility over is determining which trees were obtained. Um, the Arboretum is actually owned by the USDA, so there were a lot of hoops to jump through and things to go through, uh, so to speak. But um, ultimately, Richard Olson, who's the director of the Arboretum, was the one who okayed or nayed every tree that, that got chosen. They would bring uh, a selection of trees uh, that they were like, I have this on my shopping list, so to speak, or people would uh, come. In, in most cases, people would come with a donation and, and they would be. Uh, they would reach out to them, so, yeah. And finally, some lessons uh, to speak about. Um, one of the, the biggest things I learned from this uh, experience is that uh, decisiveness is incredibly important. Um, in order to take care of a collection of this quality, um, it is important to work fast and to work decisively. Um, this does not mean not considering big decisions it just means uh, when, once you have reached a level where you are comfortable working within that space, uh, what you are doing needs to be very intentional and it needs to be done uh, in a timely manner. Um, if we sat around and argued about which pot a certain tree was going to be repotted into, uh, then we wouldn't prune or lime sulfur for the trees that needed to be done during a specific time frame. Bonsai, as I'm sure you all know, is a very, very time sensitive uh, task. And so making sure everything gets done, particularly uh, in, the dis uh, in the space of um, things such as needling uh, or candling of our black pines, which we had about 30 of at that time, those all need to be done within a certain time frame or else they will not put on a second flush. So very difficult, um, but that decisiveness is really important. Um, Attention to detail can be trained is something that uh, I think I did learn from this experience. So uh, one of the things I heard right off the bat was the fact that if you cannot clean a tree well, you should not be pruning a tree um, of this caliber, so to speak. Um, so a lot of uh, that attention to detail for me during those first few months uh, was uh, honed by uh, going through and removing old three-year-old needles off of our white pines, removing uh, uh, our, what we call stem needles on spruces, so anything before our bifurcations. Uh, removing clumps of three or four, uh, where it's not a straight bifurcation and will result in swelling and knobby taper. Um, those small things are incredibly important to maintaining that high level of refinement that these trees need to be in, um, and is something that you can train by simply cleaning your trees regularly and often. Um, uh, again, we, we spoke a little bit about bonsai being energy balancing, but um, something that I emphasize, especially within the space of bonsai, Japanese gardening, or any uh, art form, is challenge your own thinking often. Uh, if you are doing something simply because it is the way it has been done in the past, think about a new way. Um, so in the situation of repotting, they had been repotted with just the two or three inches of outside soil removed um, for years and years and years, and that interior soil was resulting in the death of these trees. Um, and so something that had not been done, had not been read about, uh, boring into the core directly under the tree, packing it and refilling it was something that we found to be successful. Um, and that challenging, that way of thinking, um, it may result in mistakes, but ultimately, uh, if you are challenging that thinking, you will grow as a craftsman and an artist. So, um, Again, I spoke a little bit about formulating that rationale, but the biggest thing is, especially when you're in the curatorial space, if you have a rationale for what you are doing, you will never be at the fault. Uh, you will always have an explanation as to why a decision was made. Um, and if you are just making decisions purely off of intuition, uh, ultimately, it is going to be reflected in, in the work and the level of intention that, that your work has. Um, 
I did write down in all caps, you will get better. It takes a really long time. Um, that was something, uh, when, I, when I first started with Larry, it was very daunting. A lot of analysis paralysis and just staring at trees for a very, very, very long time. Um, but by getting hands on trees and continuing to work with them, it, you will continue to improve, even though uh, sometimes it feels like you may be plateauing or, or staying the same. Um, what, working on a wide range of trees helps to develop your eye for what your personal taste is. So um, I had uh, the opportunity to see both of the curator's private collections, and they could not be further from the main collection than, uh, than they were. Um, our uh, assistant curator has a small collection of about 20 trees that were uh, really, really incredible, but very, very wild styles. Uh, very similar to the uh, work that uh, a lot of you folks do out here, uh, designed to look after the environment that shaped these trees. Uh, whereas uh, the main curator, being uh, someone who uh, thinks not, not enough attention is shown on our, our Penjing styles, used a lot of uh, tropical species to emulate Penjing styles uh, that he had seen in, in both Vietnam and China when he was in those spaces. So. Um, I think it's always really, really, even for someone that's working in a space with amazing trees like this, it's really, really refreshing to see someone um, going out and doing their own thing or putting their new twist on something. So, um, And uh, the last thing I have on here is the fact that uh, I believe the beginner's mind is, is one of the things that you, the best things that you can have uh, when working with bonsai. So having that curiosity to ask, why am I doing this? Why am I lime sulfuring this tree with this? Uh, sub substance that smells like eggs. Why was Bondo put on these trees to keep certain trees upright? Um, asking those questions or spitting it out, out an idea that may not be um, uh, received well. Um, having the, the confidence to express things uh, or see things in, a, a, I suppose, a naive way is something that I always encourage uh, with any art form, but particularly in bonsai as well. So, well, folks, that is all I have. And uh, if you folks have any questions, I'd love to answer. Did that tree, uh, uh, I know it's a famous one, I just don't know the name. The one on the left, is that yes. lichen on the? It is, so yeah, that is the Yamaki pine, and uh, that is lichen growing up <laughs> <laughs> the scales of the bark. It's been maintained for a long time, so, yeah. Did I hear you use the word pine belt in this lecture? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> Um, what do you, what so do you, what do you do with Bondo? <laughs> we don't do anything with Bondo. But um, some of the previous uh, the artists, uh, especially on uh, like California junipers in particular, some of them uh, had begun to rot at the base. And I believe one of the past curators was like, "Well, it's rotting near the base; it's going to tip over. So let me just bond in this really hard, and we're paying the price for it a little bit, but <laughs> it happens." So, nice. yeah, of course. Was there a size classification of the trees that was like less challenging to maintain? I would say the easiest for me to grasp right off the bat was our, our chewing size trees, so 18 to 24-ish inches were probably, and that's probably just because that was what I was most familiar with. Um, the biggest trees were hard to keep uh, straight, especially in the way that you um, maintain them, making sure that you go from top to bottom is really important on a tree that has that many little t tiny pine buds. Um, and so making sure that, especially during the cleaning process, and I think that's what they were lending to a little bit with being able to clean a tree, uh, lends to your ability to um, prune a tree well, is if you are systematic enough to clean every individual twig on a tree in a way that you are able to remember <laughs> and work down from, um, it will make you ultimately better at, at, at pruning those trees. So bigger, difficult, shohin, kind of its own class of thing, uh, own class of bonsai, also difficult, but right in the middle, I think is, is what the easiest to work with was, so. You obviously have gained an enormous amount of knowledge in a short period of time. That is true. But now, <laughs> now you've made a transition I have. from just bonsai into a Japanese garden. So how do you see those? Those two have a common thread, but there's, there's way different With that problems problem. and situations. Could you describe what you're facing now and what you're <laughs> Oh, now? absolutely. Um, you're so, yeah, I'd love to. 
Um, one of the big things in the Japanese garden that, that we're facing is uh, just a lot of these trees. There was an eight month span where our curator was not. Uh, we did not have a curator, so uh, a lot of these trees are egregiously overgrown and, and in need of uh, thinning near the top. Uh, so a lot of these trees are being thinned, a lot of our hardscape is being reworked, a lot of our uh, tamamono, so our, our spherical shrubs or our, our organically shaped shrubs are way out of scale. So it's really uh, in a similar way to bonsai, you're creating an environment but it is just chipping away at it over a long period of time. Um, I did have the fortunate uh, ability to work with a lot of the landscape trees while I was there, um, but ultimately the challenges that I face now are uh, more dependent on the environment and less dependent on the individual health of one plant. So um, that I think is our biggest difference. Are right, the, uh, the trees displayed on, uh, during winter? So, uh, if we go back to this image right here, this is the winter storage for uh, the majority of the trees. So, the most trees that you'll ever see off, uh, off site uh, happens also during winter, so about only half the collection is shown off during the winter time. Um, but during this winter time period is where I, I spoke a little bit to the fact that a lot of these trees are <coughs> beautiful trees. Uh, the middle tree right there is uh, the imperial maple, so very, very famous tree, but the best you can do is jam all these really nice, high caliber trees in a very small space. I think it does an injustice to it, but at the same time, that's the only facility we had to work with, and folks folks want to see the trees in winter, so, um, so that was uh, our winter storage, and you can see the additional tables set up kind of in the front, the little black tables, um, as well as just the distance between individual trees was much, much smaller. How would you decide when to like take them out of winter storage? Because it seems like a lot of work, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, we play uh, the bonsai shuffle a lot, for sure. And playing that with 250 trees is not very fun. Um, but uh, a lot of it had to come down to uh, when would the temperature be below 30 degrees for more than six, seven, eight hours. If it's going to be below that for that period of time, that's when those root systems start to freeze up and you might see an issue. So um, that was ultimately, oh, if it's going to be 30 or 29 or 28 for like two, four hours uh, during the nighttime, but it's going to heat back up during the day, whatever. But um, in that case, uh, we had some things we could do to kind of mitigate. So certain windows could be closed, certain doors could be closed. Um, we had a temperate greenhouse, which was a, a fantastic thing. The temperate greenhouse was a backspace off of display um, that uh, kept trees at a temperature between 45 to 50 degrees so that if they needed, if they were a bit of a more Mediterranean species, uh, they could be kept in that space. Our coast live oaks were kept in that space. Um, some of those species. We had about three different tiers of temperatures that these trees could be kept at during the winter time. So. Well, thank you. For, oh, back there. For someone who's never visited, do you have a time of year or even a, a specific event that you recommend planning around? Oh, for, for the, I think for any um, tree lovers, the beginning of spring when things are beginning to emerge you're starting to see the flowering so uh, March uh, end of March uh, in DC area um, or when foliage is beginning to drop so or, ch or change color uh, I'm biased because I love those transitional seasons but um, those are I think the, the most stunning times for the trees last oh, go ahead. there you go um, what do you wish you saw more of in bonsai here in Colorado? That's a good question. Um, I think one of the big things that I learned from this experience is there are vastly different cultures of bonsai on the east and west coast. And I would like to see a little bit of that intermingling a little bit more. We, there, there are a lot of uh, phenomenal, and uh, we have the best collected skills. Uh, material in the world out here. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, there aren't a lot of uh, weird species, if that makes sense. You know, I, I, it would be difficult to see a sweet gum developed to that level here um, as opposed to on the East Coast. Uh, 
On the other hand, on the East Coast, uh, the amount of collected material is a lot lower, um, and uh, a lot of times when you go to a bonsai collection, you see a lot of sticks and pots, um, <laughs> which is, is vastly different, but again, the culture of both, both East Coast and West Coast bonsai have, have kind of uh, divided a little bit, and I'd like to see a little bit more of that, that interplay. So. All right, last question. Sure. Uh, I sent you some uh, questions on the internet on Instagram at that beach. Yeah. And you said there's a scar in the back. Is that is your picture of the back of that tree? This is a, this is the back of the tree. Oh. <laughs> so that big scar you're seeing is is the back of the tree. Yeah, okay. I'm awesome. Seeing. Yeah, because you can't find a picture of the back. Exactly. Of the exactly. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for for allowing me to ramble this long.